Steel is essential. It's an everything. Think appliances like dishwashers and dryers and fridges and microwaves or even air conditioners, not to mention planes, trains and automobiles. And every type of manufacturing from machinery needs uh, steel to build windmills, uh, solar panel systems, certainly to build out the electricity grid. When the pandemic threw supply chains into chaos, steel was no exception. Prices dropped, then popped. A boom in steel demand. Demand is relentless. I think people feel like steel is just price would go higher. I've been looking at this as probably the second biggest impact to, to steel makers ever. And, and I think that the largest impact is World War II. Impending steel shortages become a major problem as America's war production streamlines into high. Steel prices spiked 300% over pre-pandemic levels, at one point pricing over $1,900. That's up from steel's pre-pandemic price range between $500 and $800. They have turned into a bubble, and that bubble is they just go higher because they go higher. We should see prices move back probably in a pretty violent manner. Is that the bubble popping? Yes, yep. Steel is one of those categories in which prices have really risen dramatically. Steel is certainly one of those examples of shortages, higher prices, growing frustration among customers. Plus, steel remains a key material in infrastructure projects. So the Biden administration's plan to inject billions into U.S. infrastructure will be a huge boon to the steel manufacturers. We estimate that for every hundred billion dollars of new investment in infrastructure, that's going to mean five million tons of additional steel demand. 2021 steel demand is expected to increase 3.8 percent over 2020, according to the World Steel Association. Can the U.S. steel industry keep up with demand? And what happens when that bubble pops? Steel can be manufactured in two ways. First, there's the integrated method. In the simplest terms, you mine iron ore, you smelt the ore in a blast furnace with additional materials like coke, a form of processed coal, and limestone, and then you've made steel. But in the United States today, we actually make 70% of our steel using a different method, which is what we, in the industry, we call the electric arc furnace route. Uh, it's, it, it's a way of melting down old steel, scrap steel, into brand new steel. Previously produced steel, old car bodies, refrigerators, steel that was in old buildings, and that is shredded and melted down. Other alloys are added in, like some new iron ore, and then the furnace is tipped to pour out the molten steel. When it comes to clean steel, the U.S. certainly is leading the way. But there is work yet to be done to make U.S. steel production emit less carbon. Two of the U.S.'s biggest steel companies, Nucor and Steel Dynamics, both use electric arc furnaces, or EAFs. If you think about the, the EAF furnaces, the Nucors and the Steel Dynamics, they have very competitive cost structures. They're very flexible in cost. They have a history of, of really good financial performance. And certainly their, their stock has, has increased uh, throughout all of this because higher prices have led to higher margins, which leads to higher earnings. But their stock hasn't moved as much as some of the other ones. The other ones. Cleveland Cliffs, a purveyor of the integrated method, but they have some EAF mills too. And there's U.S. Steel. The people that have moved the most, though, has been Cleveland Cliffs and U.S. Steel. The market has been very challenging. It's been very competitive. And they've had to take on inc an increasing amount of debt leading up to the pandemic just to continue on. And then because of this structural change in the market, these mills earning excessive to historical norm margins, they've been able to pay down debt, pay off debt, uh, buy back billions of dollars of shares. So the steel mills really are a different company today than they were two years ago. Steel prices are, are, are good and they will continue to be strong. Uh, it's all about demand. We have limited supply uh, and uh, people want things done right now. So that creates competition. That's the basis of capitalism. We will continue to work, to reward our shareholders and to uh, generate the cash that is necessary to reinvest in our business. The coronavirus pandemic definitely had an impact on the steel industry. Now, steel producers were generally identified as essential industries, so they weren't shut down by any government action. But many of our customers saw big drops in demand, for instance, in the auto industry, which is buys maybe 25, 26% of all the steel produced in the United States every year. 
uh, largely shut down in the spring of, of 2020 and a lot of construction projects were slowed, everything. So demand for steel dropped precipitously between the middle of March and May. So much so that you know, steel producers in the U.S. responding to that market signal did reduce production dramatically. We had a number of steel mills that shut down altogether. Steel production went way down and inventories depleted. And then demand started picking back up. So we've seen a huge, huge increase in demand. So much so that, you know, steel production today is up 60% over where it was at the low point back in May of 2020. The economy began gaining steam in late 2020 as vaccines began to roll out. We have seen with this pandemic, uh, locking things down and coming out of the lockdown was that there truly was a shortage. Buyers could not get as much steel as they required just for normal operations. Outside of nobody was able to hoard steel, nobody was able to build any inventories because the mills were limited in terms of how much of each contract they, they could they could satisfy. And they were selling much less than their, their contractual volumes just because of this shortage. And then when demand came running back, distributors were caught short and they were, everyone started uh, you know, ordering steel at the same time. And it, it does take some time to to make that steel. Uh, so our plants started coming back as quickly as they could. The U.S. also imports a ton of steel. China is easily the world's leading manufacturer of steel. So we import a lot of that and we benefit from those low prices. But again, those tariffs have been in place uh, and that causes prices to rise. I'm not saying those tariffs are a good thing or a bad thing. I'm simply saying that they would tend to drive up price and they have done that. The U.S. is the world's largest net importer of steel. Steel imports are up 17.5% year-to-date as of August 2021. The U.S. imported more than 16 million metric tons of steel so far in 2021, as of July. But depending on which country these imports come from, there's a tax on the steel imports, a.k.a. tariffs. In 2018, the president imposed across-the-board uh, steel tariffs as a national security measure because were, the concern was that the levels of imports coming in were undermining the uh, viability of the industry over the long term. President Trump said the increase in imports posed a threat that could drive U.S. producers out of business, leaving the country dependent on foreign suppliers. Then he exempted big trading partners, Canada and Mexico, from these tariffs. When the Trump administration first started to implement those tariff increases, there was a big squeeze on domestic steel. So all of a sudden, people said, I don't want to pay those tariffs. I want U.S. manufactured steel. And part of that was because it just there was this notion of let's buy American, let's, let's produce more here. But what happened, of course, when foreign steel prices go up, domestic steel prices go up. Steel prices were rising significantly uh, during much of the Trump administration and, of course, the pandemic. Customers buying steel felt the impact of both the high prices and tariffs. On the flip side, I will say the one good piece of news is because we had those steel tariffs in place in 2020, the COVID-19 crisis could have been another demand shock, very similar to what happened in the late 1990s or in 2008, 2009. And we could have seen a new surge in imports because when imports come in, at very high levels. They tend to undercut uh, domestic producers. They often sell at a loss in this market, what's called dumping. Dumping is when other firms or countries come into another country's market and dump products at artificially low prices. We put tariffs on all the crap that they were dumping from China, 25%. They were dumping the steel that we said, you can't do that. So dumping makes it hard for U.S. manufacturers to run mills at a profit. But because we had those tariffs in place, that didn't happen. And so the industry remained healthy, was able to recover, continue its its investment and be in a, in a strong position to meet the, the growing demand that we see today. You want to be running your steel mill as close to full as you can to really cover those uh, fixed costs. Suppose you really want to be running at least 85% capacity utilization, which is where we are today. But back in those years before uh, the steel tariffs were imposed, we were running only in the low 70% range. And that was really an unsustainable level for us. And that was because of the high level of imports coming in in those years. Tariffs also created an environment that incentivized the U.S. industry to invest in its facilities. We've spent close to $16 billion just since 2018 in investments in new facilities and upgrading existing facilities. We, we do have a pretty substantial amount of new capacity that's coming online that was in planning to be built for the past few years. Uh, they're coming online in Texas and Kentucky, 
and in Toledo, Ohio. As that comes online, we, we expect prices to move back towards a more historic norm. I think what, what, what really comes next is the mills are going to be earning incredible profits this year, most of next year. They have already made in revenue more than $9 billion this year in six months. The infrastructure bill will, will be uh, an icing on the cake. And I think what's next it really is, how are they going to be investing those profits? What are they doing with it? For a long time was to continue and invest in the down cycles to create higher highs and higher lows. So the mills that are coming up online now are benefiting from that. As for steel prices in the U.S. There's a supply deficit that's supported prices, and that supply deficit is easing and going away. And as that happens, we should see prices move back, probably in a pretty violent manner, at least in the start, maybe a 15 to 20 percent drop in a matter of a month. And as that happens, prices will then be on their trend line down back towards more historic levels. Is that the bubble popping? Yes. Yep. We see we see prices peaking here in the really it, it should be in this half of, of this year. So I don't know that I would say that we're in a bubble that's going to be burst. I think we're going to see continued strong demand. The good news is that steel supply capacity will rise over time. The cure for high prices is high prices. So when steel prices are high, that creates an incentive for suppliers to increase output and eventually capacity. I think you're going to see that happen. And so we hopefully will see lower prices at some point in the future, even as the world continues to use more steel.